So I'm going to try to finish uh, Hebrews here. Um, just setting the context, remember chapter 12 was talking about, really, you know, they're running this race, and there is a discipline going on um, to keep their eyes on Jesus. And all around them, people are, you know, showing that they never believed and they're fall, they're apostatizing and they're going back to the temple and then persecuting them. And there's all this contradiction of sinners against Christ and the way of Christ. Um, and he puts this in the context of you're enduring chastening. Well, what's the chastening? They didn't do anything wrong. Well, no, but they're getting discouraged by everything that's going on around them. And this is actually being worked out for their good to show them that they really don't have a continuing home here. Christ is their home. The holiest of all is their home. Their comfort has to be Christ himself. And the fact that they're so disappointed by everything around them shows that they've got a little ways to go to enter into an enjoyment of Christ that causes them to transcend their situation and live joyfully in the midst of it. And so that's what the chastening is for. Um, and, you know, they're getting tempted to be just discouraged, like, wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make them straight the path for your feet, right? Um, because they are uh, just discouraged by everything going on around them. And it's also affecting their love, which is why he warns them to watch out for the root of bitterness. There may be some grace people that become so suspicious of everything that moves because of all the apostasy that now they turn and start accusing even other grace believers looking for anything um, that would indicate that maybe they're apostates, you know. And, and the enemy takes advantage of that and sows tears into that situation. And we see, you know, you can have wolves that instead of apostatizing with those who left, stay and pretend to be grace people and use the heightened sensitivity of the situation to persecute genuine believers. Um, so he doesn't want them to be defiled by this. He doesn't want them to be offended by it. He wants them to strengthen that which remains and continue to run the race and remember that they are not in the scary atmosphere of Sinai, but they have been brought into the atmosphere of Zion, which is a pleasant atmosphere, the city of the living God, right? And they need to realize that, yes, there will be a severity of judgment to those who fell away, and, and God will take care of that. <laughs> and they need to encourage each other and stay together. It's in that context that chapter 13 starts, let brotherly love continue. And do not forget to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do to me. And the way I look at this is, look, you're, they are in the midst of persecution. So, even in that kind of environment, they can continue in brotherly love, and he's showing them their sources of comfort, okay? He's got, like, a list of, you know, you can entertain strangers. You know, it's funny that sometimes you're, the only comfort you're going to have is from strangers because the situation among believers has gotten so bad. And in the midst of receiving strangers, God will send you angels. You know, I think I may have had an experience like this before. I don't know. Uh, where a homeless work person encouraged my faith. And if I hadn't been open to hospitality, he wouldn't have been able to speak a word, which he may have been an angel. You don't know. And so, in other words, he's saying here, look, God is has other ways to comfort you. Strangers. <laughs> 
I just think that's funny because you would think that you'd receive comfort in the house of God uh, among the people that identify with him. But because of the environment, he's saying, look, God will send you angels through strangers. Just stay open to the love. Um, and then those who are in bonds, you know, so that shows the real persecution, you know, uh, that was going on. And he's talking about people who are really suffering adversity and they were members of the body. And he says, remember them, you know, remember that you're not the only ones suffering. There are others who have it worse. You at least have your freedom. And then marriage is another source of comfort. Uh, you may have a terrible marriage, but it's better than being alone in some, you know, <laughs> um, but marriage is honorable in all in the bed undefiled whoremongers and adulterers God will judge this the, the marriage is more honorable it's higher than everything and it's higher than church authority uh, just keep that in mind that church authority does not usurp m the authority that you have in your marriage um, a lot of times pastors will get the support of a wife and turn her against the husband where she'll have a divided loyalty between her husband's discernment and pleasing the religious system i guess a guy could have it too but the loyalty has to be to the marriage and i've seen this where i was in that cult they broke my marriage up basically uh, I saw several marriages fall apart because they wanted you to take a side with them against your marriage. And this verse convicted me when I was out and, and I sh helped me realize that there are th they were practicing ungodly authority because marriage is honorable. Actually, in some translations, it says above all. Marriage is the highest institution and the church doesn't, marriage is not for the church. Marriage is its own thing and is a picture of Christ in the church. Um, so because of that, you should be safe from tampering in your household, in your marriage. That should be a place where this persecution isn't allowed to enter. Again, I believe he's speaking to sources. He's, he's referring to them to sources of comfort, strangers that might be angels, People, remembering people in prison who have a worse plight than you uh, and even marriage and then whoremongers and adulterers God would judge so you know it's just interesting why, why he put that there um, if you violate marriage God will judge and now that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll go to hell it means God will discipline you if you're a believer uh, you will not um, you will have consequences that are pretty heavy. And I can tell you that from my own experience. Uh, just leave it at that. So anyway, but that's how honorable marriage is as a source of comfort. Um, then let your covetous conversation be without covetousness. Be content. Why? So that you can say the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do to me. Again, he's talking about God has given you sources of comfort. In, in spite of all this, he is your helper. Just be content with what you have. Don't be longing for something else. It's a door for the enemy to come in and rob you of your joy and rob you of your confidence. And then, actually, it can uh, bring you to a place where you can be manipulated by men. <laughs> so whenever you want something that you don't have, sneaky men can come in and manipulate you through that desire the enemy loves to do that so if you're content then you can say the lord is my helper he's supplied everything for me all these comforts come from god he has provided he is your helper and you don't have to fear what man can do to you again everything he's saying here is the i believe or he's listing sources of real comfort that god is providing in the midst of all this persecution so that their hearts don't grow cold so that they can let the brotherly love continue and then he says uh remember them which have spoken the rule of over uh, which remember them which have the rule over you 
who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Now, he's talking about people who have testified of Christ. And look at them. They're enjoying the rest. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In other words, they're a pattern to show you that Jesus is faithful. And if he did it for them, he'll do it for you. Um, I have done a study of this in the past. I don't believe rule over you is the best way to say that because, again, uh, that, can, that has been used by so many to exert ungodly authority over. And, and they're not to rule over us lording it over the flock they're not to uh to uh be like the gentiles having authority exercising authority over and in fact a little further along here um he says uh obey them that have rule over you again that obey there is the word piso i think p-i-e-s-o in greek and it means to be persuaded by uh Let's see, hold on. P E uh, P E I T H O to be persuaded, to suffer oneself to be persuaded, to be induced to believe and have faith in a thing. To believe and be persuaded of a thing or and to listen, obey, yield to comply with. So there is a certain but the obedience is not that they're giving you instructions on how to live your life and you have to obey them because they're the authority. No, you're being persuaded by them concerning what they testify of which is the gospel and you're believing it okay and you are being persuaded in your mind it's still your will you are not submitting your will to them to where they have control over you i don't need to labor that point most of us are out of those situations but um anyway be encouraged because they're another source of comfort the testimony of those who've spoken the word to you and all of us have that at some level someone or else you know even if it's books we've read even if we haven't heard the grace message from anybody because we can't find anybody who's not a legalist we've probably read something <laughs> and those people who've conveyed to us the message of grace have left us a testimony that this thing works that christ is faithful and then he says be carried not about with diverse and strange doctrines for it's a good thing that the heart be established with grace not with meats that have not profited them that have been occupied therein. And uh, we have an altar thereof that they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Therefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate. Let us therefore go forth unto him without the camp bearing his approach for we have no continuing city but we seek one to come so what is he saying here he's saying look in the religious systems there's all these people who are being carried about by all kinds of diverse and strange doctrines they're definitely not being fed with grace and they're being served food that comes from uh it, it's not profitable for them at all and we know that from the religious systems the church system has no food in it that will profit anyone who's occupied with it. It won't establish your heart in grace. It'll just carry you about by in by winds, right? And we who are eating of grace at the table of Jesus Christ, even though we're alone, even though we are persecuted, even though we're outside of those systems, we have an altar that they have no right to eat, which served the tabernacle. Now remember... On the one hand, the tabernacle spoke of the earthly system of Judaism that was still going on in Jerusalem that people were tempted to go back to. But if you remember chapter 9, it also talks about the outer tabernacle means all the people who have not yet cleansed their conscience with the blood of Jesus Christ are still in their works, maintaining themselves, maintaining the lampstand and the showbread and the incense altar, as long as they're standing, serving in that capacity, continually working to try to cleanse their conscience, that's all a picture of trying to cleanse your conscience through some other means other than the blood of Christ. As long as you're doing that, it shows that the way to the holiest has not yet been manifested and you have not entered the rest of God, right? 
So, but those who have entered the rest and those who are eating grace and have ceased from all these labors uh, to maintain themselves and are just sitting there believing Jesus have an altar that those who have not entered that rest have no right to eat. <laughs> they have no right to it. It looks like they're doing it. It looks like they're doing all the righteousness and they're the ones that are doing everything and have, they have a boast of their works. And you might be tempted to be discouraged and say, well, I got nothing out here. No, you have an altar that they have no right to eat of because the only people who eat of that altar are those who have been brought into the holiest of all through the blood of Jesus. And it's only in the rest that you can feast. If you go back to laboring to perfect your own conscience apart from the blood of Christ, you won't be at that altar. You'll be back in the tabernacle where all the religious labor is going on. Um, then he says, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own, his own blood, suffered outside the gate. And that's us. We are to go to Jesus outside the camp. So outside the camp, it seems like we have nothing. We're apart from the religious system. We're apart from the works. We've been rejected by those who should be our brothers, but it turns out they don't actually believe. And yet, what do we have? We've got strangers who might be angels. We might have our marriage. We can remember those who are in affliction. We can remember those who have uh, given the word to us. And then most of all, we have Jesus himself. And we're to come to him outside the camp, realizing that he bore the same reproach, and we are to bear that reproach. For we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. This is not our home. We're not supposed to feel home here. We're supposed to feel like aliens and strangers, just like Abraham. That puts us in the, fa in the same kind of walk that Abraham had when he dwelled in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob in in contrast to Babel, you know, and all its goings on. And same with Moses, who suffered the afflictions of Christ with the people of Christ, instead of enjoying the treasures and the pleasures of Egypt. We're the same way we've gone out. Um, by him, therefore, let us offer uh, the sacrifice of praise to God continually, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. That is what is pleasing to God. If you want to know, am I pleasing to God, just have a heart full of thanksgiving. Because a heart full of thanksgiving is a heart that's acknowledged what God has done for you. And it's a heart of faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. But by faith, we draw near to him. And as we draw near to him, we're drawing near to him in Christ, the beloved son. And he's our entrance. And he's the one that the Father delights in. So whenever we come in him, we are coming in the Father's delight. And therefore, uh, we are satisfying to him. And we prove it by our thanksgiving. Um, by, do, no, do good to say, communicate, uh, forget not, for which the sacrifices God is well pleased. Also, we, we help fellow brothers, right? And then obey them, be persuaded by them, that have rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch over your souls, and they that might, might give an account. They do it with joy and not with grief, for it is unprofitable to you. Okay, you don't want to grieve those who are contending for your soul by arguing and by continually uh, distracting from grace and going back to all these other things. In context, how would you grieve them? Well, by going into sin and by not growing in grace, you know. Um, they want to give an account for your soul. Now, I don't know who this is in my life, to be honest. I really don't. Because everything I've got, I've read from books of people that died. <laughs> and I don't know who this is. I don't know whose soul I'm in charge of. You know, I just don't know how this applies to me. Uh, all I can say is, let's not grieve each other. Let's fight for each other. We are brothers and sisters. We don't want to see anyone fall short of the grace we don't want to see anyone fall into sin and have to be disciplined. We don't want to see anyone with a fruit of bitterness and letting their heart grow cold. We definitely don't want to see anyone in unbelief. Let's not discourage each other, but let's, uh, let's hold each other up and take responsibility for each other, you know? Pray for each other. Maybe I don't know who that is in my life or who I am 
in someone else's life, but in this community that seems to be God put it together, you know, this community on my channel and then my channel, there's Patrick L and there's Saved by the King or Love by the King and Kim Mosley and Kim Fisher and Tim Henderson and Barry and uh, Lily Girl and uh, Amanda Christian and Sherry and you know all of this somehow we all got linked together as a community we really did Greg Jackson and these are all those who are contending for grace for the sake of all the people that are on the channel who are a fellowship and we need your prayers and we we are grieved if any of you seem to fall short and if we fall short you'd be grieved so um that's our community that's who we are to each other in this uh okay sorry this see this chapter i don't like the end chapters of some of the books in the bible because it they they are all these last minute admonitions and stuff that it's like well what is you know it gets kind of random and disorganized but it's not it's really not um pray for us for we then for we trust that we have a good conscience and all things willing to live honestly so we need prayer too that we would be the real deal it's easy to fall into hypocrisy of any kind and especially since we're preaching the word we need the lord to strengthen us so that we can walk uprightly and not have anything bothering our conscience so the enemy can't attack us and silence us um i beseech you rather to this that i may restore to you sooner now the god of peace and i believe this is paul honestly other people there's a mix of opinions but i just feel this feels like paul to me who is limited from from coming to them because of various situations and he mentions timothy a little later um but anyway now the god of peace who brought again from the dead our lord jesus that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you perfect in every good work to do his will working that which is well pleasing in his sight through jesus christ to whom be glory forever and ever now this is again there, this is the mention of the everlasting covenant that is connected with the great shepherd of the sheep this is not a covenant god made with you and me this is a covenant god made with christ that christ would be the shepherd of the sheep and give his life for them and it is through the blood of the everlasting covenant that god raised jesus from the dead uh he laid his life down on our behalf and on the basis of the covenant god raised him from the dead that was his agreement and now christ has been appointed as the shepherd of the sheep to give us that life and now by that life christ is making you perfect it's not the covenant that makes you perfect it's christ himself to make you perfect in every good work to do his will see this is different than the new covenant new covenant is i will put my laws in their minds and in their hearts and write them and and cause them to walk in my way this is something different this is the everlasting covenant that the father made with the son who has now become our shepherd to give us his life and by that life perfect us it's a little different it is different because it's by the working of life and that's a whole set of principles the resurrected life of christ the law of the spirit of life um and walking in the newness of life uh has a whole different set of principles governing it than just writing his laws in our inward man and causing us to walk in his way there's a little more going on here i'll just leave it at that make you perfect in every good work to do his will working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight and what is well pleasing in his sight believing in christ and having a heart full of thanksgiving and having a heart that's warm and receptive to the love of god manifested through other people even if they're strangers because they might be angels i keep bringing that up i don't know why in contrast to the religious camp which you've been separated from bearing his reproach right um and i it, beseech you brethren suffer the word of exhortation so for i've written a letter of, unto you in a few words so apparently there was another letter that went with this with some kind of exhortation i don't know something personal know you that our brother timothy is set at liberty so timothy was in bonds and now he's been allowed out i guess with whom if you come shortly i will see you if he comes shortly i will see you with him i will see you salute all them that have rule over you and all the saints 
they of Italy that salute you. Grace be with you all. Amen. Okay, so I believe this was Paul writing from Italy to the Hebrews, but that's just me. All right, I guess I'm done here. This is a little random, but hopefully there was something encouraging in there. Take care.